This is Foul Players Radio, your podcast for arts, entertainment, and pop culture. Welcome. My name is Michael Spedden, your host. Every episode features fun, fascinating stories about people in the performing arts, actors, authors, dancers, writers, musicians, athletes, you name it. Folks who are center stage, backstage, on camera, or behind the scenes. Sit back and listen. Let's have some fun. Foul Players Radio is a proud production of the Foul Players Group and the official podcast of the Foul Players of Perryville. Hey, you guys, this is Gina Shock, drummer of the Go-Go's. Snowman here. Hey, Mary Jo Peel here. Hi, this is Kathy Ladman. Hi, this is Jay Nedry from the Road Ducks. This is A.D. Adams, and you are tuned in to Foul Players Radio with your host, Michael Spedden. Hey, folks, tonight on Foul Players Radio, our guest is someone that we all know, especially if you're from the Baltimore area. Please welcome Keith Brewer. I remember as a teenager going to the famous teen nights at Maxwell's and the dances at my high school and seeing the Ravens and all the other great bands from that time. We spoke about his career as a musician in the bands Climb a Donkey, The Ravens, Company of Wolves and Barley Juice, some TV and movie roles, and an upcoming show. The Ravens will be performing a show at Wrecker Theater in Towson, Maryland, Saturday, September 30th, with special guests the 1974. Sounds like a great show. So tickets are available at therecordmd.com. Keith Brewer's music, The Ravens, Barley Juice, Company of Wolves, and others can be found here, www.riferecords.com. That's R-Y-F records.com. Don't forget, every Tuesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern is the back of the rack, the Michael Spedden Show. I hear they have a great host. Hey, on 97underground.com, Baltimore's pure rock worldwide. You can listen at home on your laptop or download the app and listen wherever you go. Looking for some great professional entertainment for your venue, office party, fundraiser, or other special event? Please consider a murder mystery from the Foul Players of Perryville. For bookings and more information, www.foulplayersofperryville.com, email foulplayersperryville at yahoo.com, or call 443 600 446 We'll be right back with Keith Brewer after these words. Hello, listeners. We at Foul Players Radio thank you for all of your support over the past 10 seasons and nearly 300 episodes. We would like to encourage you to keep listening and spread the word. Audio versions of all episodes can be found on our main website, foulplayersradio.com, as well as on many of the other platforms you can see here. You can find all of our Season 9 and 10 episodes, as well as some Best of Episodes and Shorts on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash at foulplayersradio. Be sure to hit the subscribe button to get alerts when new episodes are released. No matter what platform you choose to listen, you can help us greatly by hitting the subscribe button and giving us an honest review. You can also help us by supporting us at patreon.com slash foulplayersradio or at buymeacoffee.com slash foulplayerw. Your support makes it possible for us to continue to be your one-stop shop for all of your pop culture needs. Be sure to follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for new episode announcements and news and updates on all of our guests. Thank you, and enjoy this episode. And welcome back to another episode of Foul Players Radio. Michael Spedden here, and tonight... You know, if you're from the Baltimore area, you're all going to know this guy because he's been you know, performing here for quite a while and a lot of different bands that have been very, very popular. Talking about Keith Brewer. Welcome, Keith. Good to see you, bud. Hey, thanks, Michael. Good so, Keith, you. Um, you know, we've got a Ravens show coming up next week. Tell yeah, us man. about that a bit. You know, over at Wrecker, huh? Yeah, the Wrecker Theater. And I'm actually interested to get inside there because it's been closed and renovated and opened again since I was there. The Ravens did a show, a memorable show there uh, 10 years ago. Uh -huh. And we had a lot of other uh, bands from the 80s, like uh, some people from um, from the Vamps and uh, AR-15. and Oh, yeah. Quinn from the Sharks. So it was quite a bill and uh, the place was packed. And we're really trying to hope that uh, the promoter was really hoping to create that excitement again. So we'll mm -hmm. see what happens. He's got people on the patio all day, uh, like Spike, Never Never, mm -hmm. uh, a couple other guys that are new to me. And um, he's got the 1974 playing a, a set before us. Mm -hmm. um, 
so we'll see how much excitement we can um, create on that. Oh, it sounds great. It sounds great. Um, yeah, I'd first, you know, I guess discovered you, you know, years ago when I was a teenager, as I was telling you before the show, um, mm -hmm. you know, the Ravens were, you know, you did a lot of stuff at Maxwell's, you know, the all ages shows and everything. Um, and I used to go to those quite a bit, um, you know, and there it, it was you all, there was, you know, you had just mentioned the vamps. Um, there was, I think, Paper Cup or Shore Patrol. I can't remember what they were called. Um, you remember them, I'm sure. I think they were Shore Patrol by then, yeah. Probably. Um, and let me see, um, Boot Camp. Um, boot Camp. Um, uh, growing Up Different. Um, that was uh, Scott McGinn's band, I think, after Face Dancer. After Face Dancer, right. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, th th those were great times. I mean, the 80s in this town, and I've had, you know, a number of guests on, that said that was just a magical time, you know. Um, and, and you know, you were in one of the premier bands in this area, you know, in you know, this region, really, you know, at that time. Um, you know, what, what was that time that like for you? You know, I mean, you were kind of, you know, you guys were sort of like, you know, I guess you could almost call it the Mount Rushmore of Baltimore area bands at, you know, <laughs> at that time. You know, what, well, what was that, that, you know, those times like for you? Yeah, that, uh, that they were the best. I mean, because that was when we actually broke out. That's when we got discovered. Mm -hmm. When the Fast Times movie came out and with our song Raised on the Radio and and we got a record deal subsequently from that. And um, just had, a you know, 98 Rock did a killer job promoting us mm -hmm. you know when a band gets that kind of promotion um you know it blows up and oh, it really does everybody in baltimore knew who we were mm -hmm. and uh you know and it was a lot of fun we, we we played the gigs we wanted to play uh as opposed to like every gig that we could get which was in the 70s for me um <laughs> yeah know what you, you mean. know and, and you're right and you know, our price went up and it, you know it was very magical and we were writing constantly like rob and i were just mm -hmm. i mean we had rehearsals every week and we'd just come up with oh, i got this and i got this and i got this and then we mm -hmm. the ravens those five guys were it was magical because they all contributed to every one of those songs you know it wasn't like other bands i've been in where you write a song, you bring it to the band, you got to kind of tell them what you hear. I'm going to hear, hear this and I hear this. Uh -huh. and, I, and everybody would come in. Lee would come in and do some amazing bass riff. And oh, oh, he's it. he's awesome. Yeah. And Tim, same way. And David uh -huh. Bell. Um, David Bell was my discovery. I'll continue saying this until I die. But uh, he was the youngest. He was the kid. Uh -huh. and, um, I discovered him at Pecora's up in Bel Air playing with a band called Grand Slam from Southern Maryland. He was just a 21 year old. And I was like, dude, you want to be in the Ravens? And he was like, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> so it was magical. Like and Dave, you know, I, I appreciate it more now. I think later when I look mm -hmm. back, when I've been in more difficult situations, musical mm -hmm. situations, and I look back and I and I remember, you know, Dave and Rob like working out these parts together, and just it really was, you know, very uh, mesmerizing, like the way that every song would come together. So. Yeah. One thing that I really remember, you know, because I was in a number of bands back then too, and the one thing that I remember that I think is really missing a lot more today. Um, and you know, just tell me if you agree, it, it seems like a true, uh, it seemed like that there was much more of a true connection with the fans back then. Um, because whenever a show was coming up and at least this is how it is for how it was for us and you know, like a number of other people I've spoken to experienced the same thing, you know, there was no Facebook back then. There was no email back then. Right you had to let people know you were playing, you were out at that club and that was expected of you. You were mm -hmm. handing out flyers. You were giving out tapes. You were doing what you needed to do to get people in there. You mm -hmm. were meeting people and you were developing your following that way, not just putting things out and hoping people show up. You know, do you, you agree? Yeah, I, I, I agree to an extent. Like I said, like that was the magical period where we didn't have to do that because we had radio. 
Right, right. And right. we had these nightclubs like Maxwell's that would advertise on the radio and right. it made all the difference in the world. It was much more powerful than Facebook or any mm. other social media. Um, but yeah, I definitely went through a lot of the days when you were calling up all your friends and going, will you please come out to the gig? <laughs> and it was just, you know, mm -hmm. how it many times like, did you do that? <laughs> yeah. Well, it seemed like in a lot of ways too, it was always like your inner circle of friends were the last ones to show up. You really had to get out and earn other people coming, you know, by, you know, putting on a good show and, you know, networking and talking to them and schmoozing them and, you know, spending your beer money on their beers to kind of, uh, you know, get things flowing. But well, there was the whole there was the whole concept. And I know you would probably remember this, like every club owner knew mm -hmm. you had to bring in bands that attracted the girls. Oh, yeah. The girls, the girls attracted the guys. The guys bought the drinks for the girls. It was like very <laughs> yep. this formula that always worked. So yep. mm -hmm. if you had a cute guy like David Bell in the band, like, you know, you attract some girls and then you had some guys and before you knew it mm -hmm. that's why you get booked right you right have them all you had to rock them out too so mm -hmm. yeah but that, that was probably my downfall you know i was never in a big chick magnet band you know i was <laughs> <laughs> well then you had to rock harder man yes I mean... we did yes we did that was a that was that was our uh that was our recourse right there but you're right. You know, uh, radio was huge back then. And then we had some really nice music publications at the time, too. You had Rocks, Maryland Musician, and other ones out there. And yeah. they were thick every month, too, if you remember, you know. Um, they were. It, with they were. all kinds of, you know, ads and articles about everybody. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, I know you guys got a lot of press back then and everything um, in, in these publications, you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, Susie Mudd, of course, was our was the editor of the Maryland musician, the Baltimore musician, whatever it's called, the uh, mm -hmm. music. Movie. Yeah. And uh, she would write about us all the time. And a lot of her, the people that she, you know, they would review everything. Mm -hmm. You know, it was good to have that. And I remember there was a similar paper in Harrisburg with the Pennsylvania, whatever it was. But anyway, yeah, we had these music and rocks. Mm -hmm. I saw a Rocks t-shirt Friday night when I saw you. Yeah, yeah. As a matter of fact, um, after you know, I, I stuck around, you know, we went to see, we ran into each other folks at Lou Maestro's show. Uh, mm -hmm. Lou Maestro was uh, two episodes ago from where you're going to be. But um, I, uh, you know, I've, I've known Lou since the 90s. We all recorded at Invisible Sound. Mm. And uh, Lou did a show. I, that's where I connected with Keith. Um, and then afterwards, I went over because there was a get together for um, Ronnie 1010 Yunkins at McAvoy's and a lot of rocks mm -hmm. and 97 underground alumni were there. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. I matter of fact, they brought a rocks T-shirt that would fit me. So, hey, you know, it's <laughs> they're uh, still it's, around. Well, actually, you know, I'm remembering that I met Lou opening up for the ravens at maxwell's so yeah. this is all circular <laughs> right 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 yeah right it's um it, it's small to more you know you always <laughs> run into somebody who's connected to somebody else you know and um because you know the interesting thing about lou with me well you know not only did we record at the same studio and play a lot of the same places back in you know late 80s and early 90s he has two siblings that are actors in my murder mystery group too um, mm -hmm. and his brother and sister both performed with me and I met them all years apart and I was like wow you know it's just a one of those things um yep yeah. so um the lineup that you have coming up for uh, next Saturday night um who all are you going to have with you um in the Ravens in the Ravens yeah well, it's the original Ravens. I mean, oh, it is the original. Okay. Well, there are there are actually two original Ravens, which most people know, but the people that discovered us after we cut the records probably don't realize this as much. But Bobby Hurd, mm -hmm. who's right. the this guy, John Tracy, who is now unfortunately not with us anymore. Mm -hmm. Those two guys were the original drummer and uh, second guitar player. Right, right. And uh, they left to go with John Palumbo. Mm hmm early on in the game and that's when we brought in timmy and david mm -hmm. uh, so it's all the original players man i mean we're kind of beating the odds here because there's a lot of bands that are a lot bigger than us that have lost mm -hmm. a lot of members from either passing away or 
quitting or right, drugs right. or whatever. Mm -hmm. But it's Rob Fay, of course, the the Ravens guy. It's me. It's mm -hmm. uh, Tim Steele on drums, Lee Townsend on bass, and David Bell on guitar. Mm. And it's we're very fortunate that we we're all still together and we can all still walk. Right, right, right. Yeah, that, that's what I was just curious about because um, it seems like about twelve years ago, and you had kind of mentioned this too. When Facebook came out, there were like a lot of these like different club reunions around town. Like there was like a network reunion, Maxwell's reunion, Hammerjack's reunion, and a lot of the you know bands that had been broken up for a long time had come out. But it wasn't always you know the same lineups, or it was you know maybe two or three guys with somebody else playing with them and everything. And I just wasn't. I, what I was you know kind of asking was you know is everybody coming back for this was kind of what I should have said but yeah uh, yeah. yeah actually I'm the only one that doesn't still live in Baltimore uh, right right <laughs> but uh, uh, David spent some time in 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 Florida but he's back in Baltimore now and I'm mm -hmm. I'm the odd man out man I live uh, above Philly oh okay okay um yeah I I remember I um, hearing I think um. I ran into you or I saw you years ago when they used to have like music conferences where they would, um, they had them in Washington and they had them in other places where you would go and um, they would have like people in the business do breakout sessions. You can go learn about the music end of the business. And um, mm -hmm. were you doing like radio work or jingles or something at one time too? Well, I did a lot of, I did a lot of radio work, a lot of jingles. I did a lot of voiceovers. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I don't know whether I was there about that, but I, I, I could have been, I mean, I used to go, well, my other band company of wolves, which happened after, uh -huh. after the Ravens, the, uh, I remember being down there at one of those conferences. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't remember why. Yeah, right, right. You drink a lot more than I do now. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Well, that's the thing, too, you know, it's just uh, sometimes we got to get each other together to kind of try to piece together things that happened yeah, back then, too, that exactly. we remember, you know, because uh, I think every one of us has the block of every story that's missing, you know, something happened, yeah. and then, you know. <laughs> well, I had a, I, I, I have a really funny story, actually, if you're, if you're ready for a story. Please, absolutely. <laughs> Just about that that I remembered the other day. I went to see Kix's uh, farewell mm -hmm. show on Saturday, and uh, you know they never disappoint. Um, but I remembered that uh, my uh, Celtic band, Barley Juice, that mm -hmm. uh, been together for about 23, 24 years now. Uh, years ago, we were playing a double header around st patrick's day these celtic bands get a lot of work you know oh yeah mm -hmm. happened to be playing loonies in one of their afternoon slots and then we were going to harrisburg for a late night gig mm -hmm. same day and somebody at loonies brought out these i don't know what they were but they were they were deadly and i had one too many <laughs> and i probably i remember saying to the fiddle player like i probably shouldn't be on stage right now <laughs> we finished our set they poured me into the van drove to harrisburg poured me out of the van i was just starting to like sober up for my gig and these everywhere i go you know like i recognize sound men stage mm -hmm. people because they've all been around and they all changed places just like we did certainly yeah so there were these two guys and this one guy is telling the other guy as we're setting up Oh, uh, yeah, you know, he's just, I said something like, uh, they, where are you from? How do I know? I said, oh, well, you might remember from the Ravens. Oh, yeah, yeah, I remember Keith Brewer from the Ravens. And I'm like, well, that's me. Like, no, no, no. no, I remember Keith Brewer this one time. And he was telling the other guy, this one time, he and Steve Whiteman got in a fight. He goes, it was crazy. Like, oh, man, they were like you know, seeing fire and they got in this fight and they were throwing epithets back and forth and almost came to fist. I'm like, that never happened. <laughs> and they're like, no, it did. I was there, man. You weren't there. I was there. I'm like, it never <laughs> happened. I'm Keith Brewer. And for some reason that every time mm -hmm. I said I'm Keith Brewer, I was invisible. Right, 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 right. Just mm -hmm. kept going. And the other guys in my band in Barley Juice were just looking at me. <laughs> what is going on? Uh, I know. Mean, White man and I have always been friendly. We've always. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. It was just like so funny. Like, 
Yeah, yeah, man. They almost came to fisticuffs, and I <laughs> had to break it up. Uh, and then you're like, oh, then what else should I do? To get together to yeah. piece together the pieces and then make sure that everything's uh, as it was. Right, right. So then you probably said, so then what did I do? You know, tell me what I did, you know. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> I mean, I, you, I see stuff on Facebook. Somebody goes, yeah, remember that time you were down at the barge and you kicked that guy's keyboard off this, like, that never happened. Huh? Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah, I did drink more than I thought I did. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And, and I, I've actually, with some of the bands I was into, there were there were a couple of incidents that um didn't happen that I've had to go back and say, well, no, no, that, that's absolutely nothing. So I kind of yeah. know where you're coming from with that here. Um, right. So uh, looking at this, you know, you were talking about, you know, you know, your Celtic band, and you've been doing this for a good while now. I mean, you've got, I was looking at your... um discography here and you've got what about oh, what, eight or ten albums i think uh with barley uh, juice barley juice has seven albums out and one of them is a collection i think but um, oh okay okay but yeah it, it, we caught the uh you know i i when i was in company of wolves i went to uh scotland to to the for the first video called mm-hmm. the Wild, and we filmed that in scotland and doing castle and um fell in love with the pipes fell in love with scotland and everything so when i came home mm-hmm. and uh i married my uh previous wife i we went over i took her over there and then we had to learn how to play the pipes and one thing led to another and the next thing i know i'm playing with these other guys who are rockers mm-hmm. who are in a bagpipe band oh right 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 so and then we thought we could only play like maybe on saint patrick's day Mm-hmm. I don't want to hear this any other time. Well, stupid me. There are festivals all over the world. You can play mm-hmm. Celtic music all year long. So uh, the success of Barley Juice basically uh, fell upon the fact that we found festivals and we just started playing all over the country. And it's been a it's been a fun ride, man. Right, that's great. That, that's great. And that sounds like a lot of fun too. Um, whenever I've seen you know a band like that, you know that type of band play, it's always a blast. Mm. yeah i mean you never see people sitting around uh you know wanting to leave or anything when one of those shows are going on you know it seems like people are involved and it's up and you know you really get people uh in the mood you know yeah there's a lot of participation right 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 and um so looking uh, and you would also um you know of course um you know you've had you know company of wolves before uh you know you know, before barley juice and you know that you know, of course after the ravens and um tell us a bit about that band um you know I, re- I remember you know hearing it on the radio and um so tell us about you know what life was like in that band i know you had you know moved on to new york from the ravens you know in the mid 80s and mm-hmm. was uh well, up there so uh uh you know, a long story short, I mean, I would, we were all, the Ravens had had uh, lost their deal with uh, MCA and um, and we were looking for another deal and we were wondering what, what we were going to do. And uh, we were all just getting frustrated. Yeah. And uh, I, we had a manager at the time in New York City who was very invested in trying to make me a solo uh, artist okay so i left uh we all left amicably uh but i left and went to new york city and started meeting some songwriters <clears throat> some heavy hitters and uh this guy jeff kent who actually co-wrote some of the songs on that record introduced me to steve conti who introduced me to his brother john conti and just fantastic players mm-hmm. still two of my best friends like we just you know talk all the time and Frankie LaRocca was the drummer and he was a big fan of my voice. And Frankie had done, he was probably the most famous guy out of all of us because he he had, oh God, he played with Bon Jovi. He had done um, tracks with Scandal. Mm-hmm. He had right. he done tours with Brian Adams and John Waite and all these. So he introduced us to a lot of people and got us our manager, got us signed. And that was just all, like we... I really loved the writing team of us, the, the me and the Contis, but um, that was probably the most business based band I was ever in because it was all about like the big manager and the mm-hmm. big record deal. And, you know, 
doing the big showcase and signing the biggest money deal. And, um, and then they didn't know what to do with us because basically what happened was we put out this, this great rock and roll bluesy rock record and uh grunge came in. I was just getting ready to say that. I was just getting ready to say that because, um, that, that had an effect on a lot of people too. And, you know, when I, I had yeah. Brian Forsyth from kicks on the show, Mm-hmm. and grunge you know did really did kind of did the same thing to them i mean there was nothing wrong with any material that they had as was with yeah. you but you know everybody wanted seattle you know everybody wanted that yeah it type was of- and, uh, i mean that that shit was great i mm-hmm. loved i loved that stuff but uh but everything goes round in circles you know it does it does you have to um, keep doing what you're doing right 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 but uh, another thing too um I mean that that had to have been just disheartening as hell, you know. I mean, um, I guess a lot of times when young musicians, you know, we want to get our record deal. You know, once mm-hmm. you know, it's like once you get the record deal, you know, you're in the end zone, touchdown. But that's really where the work begins. It is, and, and it's where the yeah. control gets lost. Yeah, because um, as an artist, as an older artist, now I'm very happy to be independent. And I mm-hmm. have been years because I get to pick the record. The, uh, I get to pick the, the the songs. I get to pick the album cover. I get to pick the photos. You know, I mean, mm-hmm. we had no control in those years with the Ravens. Like we we didn't think very much of that record label or that record album mm-hmm. design. Um, it was thrust upon us, and um, all the decisions were made by the big people, the big money people. Yeah. Um, so the wolves, same thing happened. We toured America. They didn't know what to do with us, man. I remember going out and doing the first arena tour opening for Richard Marks. Oh, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So, yeah. so Richard Marks was this, you know, actually he's a great guy. He's a very funny guy. He's a mm-hmm. great guy, but I mean, wherever you go, whatever. And here we come out going, bah, 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 you know, and, it was just so funny. And there were all these little teenage girls. I think we probably got a lot of teenage girl fans that way because there was mm-hmm. a much younger audience following Richard Marks around. Mm-hmm. Um, but the but when we'd go to do the radio interview, they didn't know what to do with us. Right, right. Oh, and, and, uh, mm-hmm. and they put us out, they threw us out with this band and that band. There was uh, some talk of go, doing a leg with Kiss. There was a talk of doing a leg with i don't know just anybody you know and and we never made it to europe huh. uh, where we were selling a lot of records in europe and uh-huh. it was just uh you know big money uh decisions here like well let's see the numbers let's look at the numbers you know yep. let's not listen to the music let's look at the numbers uh-huh. <laughs> and and you know that frustration carries over and into just any kind of art you know the big clash between the people behind the desk and the people that are creating because i hear it you know i have a lot of connections that you know people that are like you know that write tv shows that you know they're really onto something good here but no forget it you know never mind we're gonna do something else thank you you know and that's got to be just the most aggravating frustrating thing in the world especially when this is your art i mean this is you coming out you know and mm-hmm. then all of a sudden here they come in and just, uh, you know, it's like you painted this beautiful white wall in your house and a three-year-old comes in with his crayons and just trashes right. it, you know? It was, there were moments where it was just so obvious. I mean, most of the time we were touring and we were happy. Is You keep a band on the road and they're, they're happy most of the time. Uh-huh. Unless they're not drawing anybody. But uh, But I just, there were times when I'd be over I remember taking a trip over to England um, mm-hmm. when the wolves were still together, and uh, I, I guess we were gearing up to, to do our second album. And um, I'm walking down. I was with my dad and uh, a couple of friends, and my dad had been taking a nap. And I'm walking down through Piccadilly Circus, and I get recognized, and I'm recognized. And I got these people that. A couple of girls took me around. I said, take me down Carnaby Street. Let's pick me out some cool rock clothes. Come on. And they were, oh, yeah, 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 let's do this. And this. And, and they knew us from MTV Europe, you know. Mm-hmm. But, but we weren't allowed to tour there. 
it was kind of like that whole Elvis story where they, he couldn't get out of Vegas. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. Know? And so uh, there's a happy ending to this. Uh, many, many years later, actually, we just got we just got called. Uh, there's a there's a festival in Germany in Hamburg that wants us on the bill next year. So Company of Wolves will be playing uh, Germany for the first time after all these years and all these you know, emails and letters. Hey, Wolves, Wolves, we love you, Wolves. You know, <laughs> I'm going to hit Europe. Oh, my God. Wonderful. That's great to hear. You know, that, yeah, that, that's great to hear. To. Yeah. Mm. Um, and especially, you know, since it's really, you know, been a while, you know, since I guess you've been active with that act. Um, but the fact that they want you to come over there and, um, and the thing is, you know, with hard rock and, you know, Europe is really still the place to be with that, because I know, of, you know, of a lot of acts that are still very, very successful over there. Yeah. You know, um, when they come here, they're playing like Baltimore Soundstage or Ram's Head. But, you know, over there, they're still doing stadiums and arenas. Yeah. Steve, uh, Steve Conti actually has been playing with Michael Monroe for probably 10 years, I guess now. And yeah. Monroe is a huge uh -huh. uh, rock star in Finland. And in, in, in yeah. lots of places in Europe, and mm -hmm. Steve still plays big freaking shows, you know. And yeah, <laughs> that's got to be that, that's got to be great, you know. Um, did you ever, um, with the Ravens, did you ever do any tours with them? Yeah, we did. Um, yeah. it's funny, like uh, I see pictures and I go, Oh, yeah, we were in Texas then. Oh, yeah, we were in Milwaukee at the mm -hmm. music. I don't really remember. I remember one was in a Winnebago and one we had a uh, one we actually had a, an actual tour bus. Oh, you know, okay. Driver and all that shit. Like, you know, a, a big time. Um, so we went around we went around the country, you know, and um, it, it, uh, it probably doesn't leave as much of a, 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 of a of a mark in my brain because we weren't getting support from the record companies right, like right. when the wolves went out at least the re the radio guys were doing their jobs and we were doing interviews everywhere and we were mm -hmm. attracting kids here we would go to these places and i remember there was a there was a big uh there was a joke one of one of uh our roadies walt uh mccreary uh used to do this thing he was always like the up guy like yeah yeah okay man you know get your get your get your mood up you know and we'd play someplace and it'd be half packed and we'd get on the tour bus and you'd go wait till we get to austin man you know and, and then <laughs> they would play austin and there'd be half a crowd and then wait till we get to houston man <laughs> i just remember going through texas going okay i'm waiting for the big one I'm waiting. right right <laughs> Because if a record company isn't behind you, you know, you, I mean, I know a lot of these people, SR17, oh. a lot of these people like from Baltimore know this, that if the record, once the record company isn't behind you anymore, things just, the, as my manager used to say, if the phone's ringing, it's happening. If uh -huh. the phone ain't ringing, it ain't happening. And then right. you're out there in the middle of America and nobody knows you're there. Yeah. yeah. And, and the thing is, I mean, I, I've listened to this material over the years, you know, and um, it was, I mean, I think it was just as good, you know, I mean, you, you had a number of songs that were just as good as anything else that was on the top 40, I think. I do um, too. Thank you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and why they just pick and choose who they're going to get behind. I mean, whether they're just rolling the dice or drawing straws to figure out who they're going to do it. It just doesn't seem like there's much rhyme or reason to it. And, well, you know what, Mike, you know? it's like, it, it really, again, like um, the seventies were probably the last safe time to get signed because even if, even then it was getting crowded. Right. Right. The time right. We came in in the eighties, like it was crowded mm -hmm. out there. The, the playing field was really crowded. Mm -hmm. By the time I was, I, I got into this in the nineties with the wolves, I remember having trouble getting our video, our first video, and we had more. They dumped more money into us than any deal I've ever had. Um, mm -hmm. But I remember getting uh, uh, having trouble getting uh, MTV play. Yeah, yeah, because they were getting thrown, you know, ten to twenty new bands every week, mm -hmm. and somebody had to pick two or pick, you know, out of that. 
which right. is funny because you remember as well as I do when MTV started, they didn't have enough. Yeah. Oh, I uh, know. Videos, and that's how boot camp got on there because yeah. mm-hmm. somebody. Uh, and you know, you 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 see these like biopics about like Elvis and people back from uh, Little Richard and stuff, and you see, you know, some DJ gets a hold of a record and spins it, and bam! All of a sudden, everybody's like, yeah, 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 yeah. And, you know, by the time we came along, it was too crowded to do that. You know, right? So right. Whoever heard it and liked it, it made you more more mm-hmm. appreciative. Yep. Um, and to kind of add on to that, um, you know, from what you were saying, um, the band I was in from 89 to 92 is called Orange Sheep Parade. And we had just, we were working on getting an album out. Mm-hmm. Um, and we were going to these conferences, um, you know, to try to learn about the legal end of it. And cause we didn't know anything about that. And we really didn't even have a manager either. Um, to explain these things to us. So we're trying to just go to these things and listen to these people talk and try to understand how this business works. And one thing that they were saying, which really agrees with what you were telling me here, was that, you know, in the 60s and 70s, you know, a band could come out, you know, their first album, the first album was "Eh," the next one and the next one got better and better and better. Um, what they were telling us in these conferences at that time was that you better have a home run right off the bat or else you're just not going to have a chance. Pretty much. You know, pretty much. you got a second chance by that time in mm-hmm. the music industry. You were lucky. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, somebody had to, somebody at the record company had to really fight for you if you didn't make it right. right out of the box, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's kind of a tough thing when there's so much more at play than just talent, you know, it's, um, you know, talent and then there's, uh, you know, payola and there's, uh, this person wants this, this person wants that and yeah. all kinds of other reasons that just really shouldn't be there, but are, you know? Right. Yep. Um, so when you, you had mentioned being out on the road with the Ravens, um, were you out doing just your own shows or were you opening for somebody or was somebody coming along with you? I think all of the all of the above you know mm-hmm. i remember opening up for like a billy idol oh uh, yeah you no know, just one-offs though like not not being able to jump on the leg of a tour of oh sure tour, which would have really been helpful mm-hmm. you know we would be here and be in this city and be open up for this person and mm-hmm. then in the next city we might be the headliner mm-hmm. right i remember right. once i remember one city we we showed up and uh do you remember the heavy metal band raven Yes, yes. Uh, they, they, they were just here, by the way. Bully mask. Uh, yeah, yeah. Wacko, Rob right. Wacko, something. So, yeah. Perfect example of not getting the right support from the record company. We showed up. Mm-hmm. All the kids in the front row, these guys in the front row, thought they were seeing Raven and they were smashing their head against the stage because we started, <laughs> we started with a lot of smoke. We started with like um, Vincent Price, you know, uh, uh, narrating the Raven. And then we came out with all the smoke and purple lights. And then we came out and we started our first song. They thought it was a metal show, man. And these oh, guys no. were like so geared up. And you saw them little by little sort of move to the back. And mm-hmm. you know, those mm-hmm. came over, whoever like came to see us. But... <laughs> Wow. Wow. And your name was differentiated from that too. You know, um, it can never be differentiated enough as far as I'm concerned. Right. That was Rob and I, that was probably mistake. Number one, we created the name like the Beatles, like mm-hmm. the birds, we were taking an animal or an insect and changing one letter mm-hmm. and trying to be like retro sixties guys, the Ravens. Mm-hmm. No one ever spelled that name. Right. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, and I'm, and I'm sure if that came out on the tickets and everything that were being sold, and people saw that, you know, that, that probably was, uh, yeah, even more confusing. You know, yeah. We always, I always emphasize the the Ravens, mm-hmm. not Raven, the Ravens. Right. Of course, my name's KYF, so I'm just asking for trouble. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. <laughs> um, you know, um, so uh. Let me see here. Um, I had another question here for you. Um, you know, so you, you had mentioned you're touring with Company of Wolves and some of the acts that they had you know sent you out with and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And before that, you had, you know, Climb a Donkey with a lot of the folks that you've been playing with, you know, in you know, your other bands, too. Mm-hmm. Um, tell us a bit about that. I know um, I've been seeing a lot about that on Facebook. People have been posting band pictures and a couple of stories here and there. Um, well, I was I was never in a cover band. I mean, mm-hmm. that's where it starts was I was always in a band that wrote our own material. Yeah, me too. Uh, I just, yeah. I mm-hmm. mean, you understand that. Like, I... I just something about it just skeeves me out. Like I'm like, I, I just can't I just can't play other people's shit. You know? Yeah, yeah. I like playing other people's shit. I just can't do yeah. it for a living. So right. I always had to be creative about it. And um and bar, mm-hmm. and uh climbing Alki was where I really cut my teeth because we mm-hmm. were all there were three, four writers in that band. And uh mm-hmm. Bobby Heard was in that band writing, Fred Tepper was in that band writing. Uh, Doug Robinson was in the band writing and I was writing and we were all just all this material um, and I think that was the first like kind of popular band I was ever in you know mm-hmm. like you could advertise us and people would show up um, and we recorded some and we almost got signed to a major label um, as Bobby Heard says I had more contracts on my on the table that I never signed <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but um but yeah it got a lot of attention uh and uh it eventually led to the ravens you know turned into the ravens because mm-hmm. it just got really wanted to try a new genre mm-hmm. but uh but it was we had a lot of good times we we played a lot of gigs and mm-hmm. we're we're broke all lived together uh we rent these houses and move in and there'd sometimes be eight ten people living there and we'd ruin them within a couple of years and move on to the next house yeah yeah but it was a lot of fun man i was if i had to do my 20s over again that's i'd do it again it was awesome nothing wrong with that nothing wrong with that um yeah i i know exactly um to kind of just get back to what you were saying i understand how you feel about playing in cover bands um i had done it before like some of the bands i was in like we would go out and play but we only had we and we were only doing shows where one band per set like one band would play a set another band so it was like three or four bands like places like the rage if you remember the rage yeah. and um you know maxwell's too um network um and places in dc like you know 9 30 we did um at the beginning, like if we only had five originals, we'd throw a couple of covers in to fill out the time. But mm-hmm. those were not things that we were stuck on or attached to. You know, we just kind of did it to keep the uh, to keep the set together so we could mm-hmm. you know, have yeah. enough material. But it, people would always say, "Hey, man, you do any Rush?" I'm like, "No, look, I love Rush. They're my heroes." But go see Rush if you want to hear Rush. You know, you're here. This is our show. You know, that mm-hmm. was my attitude. You know. And that still exists, and those mm-hmm. people still want to hear cover songs, man. And mm-hmm. you know, I can't put them down. I can't. There's nothing wrong with it. I got a lot of friends that that make their make all of their living playing cover songs. Mm-hmm. It's just not for me. Obviously, not for you. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Well, and 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 one thing that I was kind of mentioning too, you know, kind of like the disconnect nowadays between you know bands and the you know the people that come out. Um, where there's kind of a disconnect as well is um years ago when we were playing you know your band i'm sure you know the bands i was in everybody was up front and watching you were what was going on again mm-hmm. nowadays it's you know you know your your background music and they're taking selfies of themselves with you in the background it's like they're the star they're seeing the band you know they're it's their claim to yeah. fame is that they're there to see you and that you're the background music you know and it's about them and that well, that's what happens thing. i i i honestly think that happens uh more when you're playing cover tunes that's I true mean, yeah yeah uh although uh no now i have i have three daughters and they all play music and i saw that yeah yeah the two older ones so scotty and um Donnie Coco, they have been going out and doing some showcases and they got, I'm biased, but they're, they got really good material. And 
I'm trying to find them showcase rooms because there are mm -hmm. rooms yeah. where everybody will shut the fuck up. And right, like, right. Listen, mm -hmm. you know, and then there are other rooms where kind of like when I saw when I met you the other night, like good old Lou is up there singing. Everybody shut up at the beginning and mm -hmm. then people came in. And by the time we left, we couldn't hear him. Right, right. They were just back there. Rah, 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 rah. Mm -hmm. You know, but that was, I could see where that, where, where that room could be a showcase room, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as opposed to the downstairs, which was just like meat market. Right, so right. Well, <laughs> well, the thing is, too, you know, they had, um, I think he was about halfway into his set when the electric bands downstairs started playing. Started, was kinda, yeah. yeah. There was a little interference there, too. But, yeah. but, um, I, I thought he sounded great, you know. It was I thought he sounded great. His voice sounded just as good as it ever was, if not better. It hasn't changed a bit. And I remembered some of the tunes and you know, it was it was cool to hear him. I'm gonna go visit him on New Year's. Oh, is that right? Is that yeah, right? My wife and I are gonna, gonna go down to NOLA uh for New Year's Eve. That ought to be pretty wild. It should be. It should be. Um I've yeah. wanted to get down there. Um I've been to other parts of Louisiana and um haven't been to New Orleans yet. I'd love to go down there sometime. And I'd, I'd like to go down and check out his shop, too. It's a nice... Uh, I know. A yeah, pretty neat know. thing down there. You know, another place just opened up in um, Glen Rock, PA. I think it's called Tom's Music or something. I just saw it on Facebook. And he almost has, like, a museum of bands from this area. Like, you know, band pictures and CDs framed and flyers oh, wow. from clubs i was going to take him some stuff of my band um so he could throw you know either put it up or throw darts at it or something i'm not that's sure awesome. yeah that's awesome, man. yeah okay. yeah that's uh that, that's really a cool thing i mean and that that was the whole purpose of why i started this podcast here um mm -hmm. you know a lot of reasons because you know this region you know i mean it's not just baltimore it's you know dc pennsylvania virginia delaware you know, um, there's, there's a lot of lore, you know, a lot of, uh, stories, a lot of history, a lot of great bands and a lot of great memories in this area. And I'm trying to kind of capture that and keep mm -hmm. this archive, you know, and talk to the people, you know, I, as I'd mentioned to you, I think when we were speaking before the show, I've had DC star face dancer, um, mystic force, you know, uh, rich from mystic force. Um, I've had, um, you know, soul gypsy tainted saints you know people that have played um you know in this in the bigger clubs and you know mm -hmm. have all these memories out there um and the so thing you must is, have a lot of you must have a lot of viewers there or listeners that are i try into, um into the retro man into like uh yeah i cool. try um two of my biggest supporters you know the guys that give me pep talks a lot are dave simmons from uh dc star yeah yeah scott mcginn um He's always suggesting people and giving me uh, compliments. And another guy, you know, Buffalo Lee Jordan. You know, I know the name. Yeah. I don't think I ever met him. Right, right. Hell of a good guy. I had him on and he had so many stories. It was a double episode I had to do. I had to have him on twice to fit all the stories <laughs> in. And um, he's been a great support. You know, thank you, Lee. And um, just contributed so many stories and everything. Um, it, it, it's really been a good time. And, um, if, so that's really what I'm trying to capture is this history. Um, and, you know, one reason is because, you know, definitely the fond memories of the time. But the other reason, too, is like, look, you know, you'd mentioned this. You know, sometimes I look on Facebook, especially when I see my old music buddies and, you know, less and less of us every day, it seems like, you know. Yeah. It's, you know, it's a sad thing. And, um I'd like, I was really wanting to try to capture this history and I hate to say it this way, but while I can, you know, mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'm That's sure there's cool. going to be a, a lot of us that are going to be around for a while, but, um, I mean, there's so many people out there that have accomplished so many great things and, and, it, and it's something for us all to be proud of who have been in this area too. Mm -hmm. Um, this is definitely not a slouch area and, um, kind of from yeah. what we were saying before, you know, we could have been like, um, one moody entertainment executives step away from uh being a major entertainment area you know the baltimore everybody scene is. you know everybody is man but baltimore definitely was like um it's funny when i went to um when i moved to new york for those years 
Uh, they used to talk about Staten Island. Well, Frankie was from Staten Island, so they used to talk about Staten Island mm -hmm. like the little Liverpool because oh. it was on the water. It was like near a harbor, you know, and like it had all these influences. And I always felt like Baltimore was like that too. Mm -hmm. Baltimore and Liverpool had a lot of uh, the same um, elements, you mm -hmm. know, where we get influences from all different directions and we had so much talent here years yeah. later after i moved out you know i was just like wow baltimore mm -hmm. was like just a a, a a great melting pot of of of, of talent it, it really was it really was um the only thing that i ever thought really about baltimore and I, that was maybe just you know a little bit of a you know maybe a detriment was that um it seemed like it was you know, the bands look good. They sounded great. Lots of good material, lots of good players. But it seemed like a lot of times Baltimore was just kind of homogenous, you know. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you did much in D.C., um, you know, the 930 Club and a lot of the other clubs yeah, down there. Few, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, it seemed like down there people were just a little more free to be themselves and not really fit in the, as much of a mold as there was in Baltimore. I thought... I, and just from playing in both scenes and seeing it, I mean, I don't know if you agree or not. Um, I, I mean, there, there was diversity, had, but everybody had a little bit of a different scene, you know, like yeah, uh, uh, Philly. Oh yeah, from Baltimore and New York was different from that. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, I thought you were going to say the accent. <laughs> oh well, of course, yeah, that's um. <laughs> Because you know, I think I think Steve Whiteman was probably the one that like just you know just just uh, epitomized that you mm -hmm. know because he was just himself. Yes, I don't, yes. I don't know any other artists out there that like you know you put a mic on them and they start talking like this. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, I, mean, I know. I, when I moved to New York, I remember everybody would say, "Oh, a Southerner, mm -hmm. a Southerner." I never thought of myself like that. Mm -hmm. because the mason dicks the lines above is like we thought we were like horse people here man you know oh yeah yeah well you know but, something uh, and i agree with you i can add to that too um well go ahead and say what you were going to say now oh you i was just going to say that that i i thought that you know baltimore if anything was just like unique in 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 the the artists and and mm -hmm. just i don't know the personality of baltimore was just uh it's just always been charming Charm right City. right I agree with that. I definitely agree with you on that part there. Um, Changed a lot. Saying, There's a lot of new people, but you know. Mm -hmm. What I was going to say was that um, I'm I'm a Dundalk boy, and I got signed. Um, my wife and I are both actors now, and I got signed by you know um, management about you know five six years ago, and you know, I came in. I auditioned. You know, did a scene did a couple of other things, read some copy and mm -hmm. she signed me, which, you know, um, after having everything shoved back down my throat in my career, I finally had a victory here, you know? And, um, I think she said to me, was like, you know, look, you can't talk like that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it was, <laughs> I've been working on it to kind of neutralize it a bit, but I was, you know, I was one of these guys back in those days, you know, and I was, but, one thing that has turned around for me is that um, I've made some connections in LA and um, I've had a couple of people that needed Baltimore accent tutoring. And I did a session with them, made a few bucks, you know, read their script with them and everything. And, you know, I made a recording mm -hmm. of me reading the script as an East Baltimorean and they went. You never thought of that when you were growing up, did you? You never thought no. you had special, you know, John Travolta did a great job and, uh, Hairspray. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I mean, and when you hear people doing it, you're like, wow. Mm -hmm. Really unique. Yep. I know. You we were always trying to hide it when you were younger. You know? I, I know. I know. Um, well, I mean, with you doing a lot of voiceover and doing a lot of uh, narration, and th I'm sure that's probably, you probably got that talk too, huh? <laughs> I, I, my father was very articulate. My father had came from English descent. Oh, okay. Maybe that was part of it, but for some reason, I never spoke. I mean, you could hear my O's, you know, every mm -hmm. once in a while, you can hear the O's come out mm -hmm. when I'm not paying attention. But, but I'm still an audiobook uh, narrator, and I get away with it. Like, there's mm -hmm. just um, 
there's a thing that you know as an actor called the rate the radio voice and, mm -hmm. and, and that's universal like when these people like oprah get moved from city to city and their mm -hmm. anchors here and they're you know there and they have to sound like they're from nowhere right right that's get that used to be a big deal so when i moved mm -hmm. to new york but i still i still get it you know every once in a while somebody will stop me in the middle of like a i'll mm -hmm. be reading somebody's something and the producer will stop me and say can you just say it like this and say, oh, yeah, okay all right. I, I tell you, you know who still has hers too, even though she hasn't it didn't live here for long. It was Gina Shock. I had her on the show. Oh, I I saw her little promo. Yeah. Yeah. Um He's I did a full the interview. Go goes, hon. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And this guy Mike from Dundalk. You know, and um I was I was sitting in um I was sitting in the what what's the diner on Route 40? It might not even be there anymore. Double the old, T. Is it double T? After a gig yeah. one night with my girlfriend at the time, at Raven's Days, mm -hmm. sitting there getting breakfast, and there was this old couple sitting next to me, sitting next to us, and we heard him talking. And said, one of them looked over and said, "You're in a band? You in a band?" I said, "Yeah, I'm in the Ravens." And, oh yeah, our daughter's in a band too. Your name's Gina. She plays with the Go Go's. You ever heard of them? <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> sitting next to her parents, like at three o'clock in the morning having mm -hmm. breakfast. Yeah. She yeah. was a great interview. I really, um, you know, I, I she has a, a great book that is that it's a great, great, great rock and roll book. And oh, yeah? um, it, it's 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 a big coffee table book. Um, she was she also had the good sense back in those days to take a camera and plenty of film with her wherever she went. And I mean, it's a good, thick book and it's you know big and she's just got so many pictures of like i think she had every backstage pass she's ever had to wear every wow. you know pictures from all these shows that she did all the tours that they were on and it's really a, it's well worth checking out if you get a chance to um cool. and but but that's another thing too with radio voice is that and i've had this i've gone to coaching and stuff for voiceover and the guy says don't do announcer man i'm like well well, if I don't do an your man, I'm going to sound like this. So what's your, what's your, take your pick. <laughs> mm -hmm. When I try to talk straight or neutralized, you know, this guy almost comes out, you know, Ted Baxter, you know, or something. And Ted Baxter. Um, yeah. <laughs> you got to see, not everybody can do that. So, you right. just, I mean, you mm -hmm. hear the bottom, I hear the bottom of your voice. You hear the bottom of mine. Yeah. And mm -hmm. all the way down there. And you just, you learn how to use it sparingly. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah I and mean, I've been doing them for 97 Underground too, you know, concert announcements and that sort of thing. So I've learned to kind of play with it and, you know, cool. find out what's good and what, what isn't and everything here. Um, so, um, so this, it's been great talking to you here. Um, I mean, you know, so much, so many things that, you know, you've done here and, you know, I've been reading, you know, different things. Um, you know, uh, you know, you, you've got this article here, um, on a wiki page, you know, basically from, you know, from your, the sixties, you know, in high school years, all the way through now. And, um, very, very interesting here. Um, did you have any other, you know, stories or anything you'd like to share before we wrap up? We could do a whole book. <laughs> yeah. I mean, no, not really. Like I, I, but I do have one thing I'd like to mention about this Ravens show that I think people will enjoy oh, hearing. Please, please do. Please do. When are we airing here? Um, I can have this out by the weekend if you want. Okay, well, yeah. so it's, it's before the show. Uh, we decided mm -hmm. just yesterday that we were going to do something that we've never done. And, of course, the Ravens have been together. I guess that record came out over 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to do the, the album, the first album, in its entirety. Oh, cover great. To cover in the sequence that it is on the record, which we have never, unbelievable, but we mm -hmm. have never done it. So uh when we get to that point in the show we will do we will start with uh don't leave me this way and all the way through to the end that's great that's, that's gonna be a lot of fun we've never done it yeah yeah well that that's that's great I, i'm i hope you know you have a great crowd and you know, have a really great time that night i'm sure it's going to be an awesome show and um you know, so um, do you have, um, you know, a website or anything else you'd like to push? Um, you know, this is the, uh, I call this part the uh, the shameless plug portion of the Famous evening. plug? You got to have them. Um, 
Yeah, well, it's it, we tried to make it as easy as possible. I devised a record label years ago called Riff Records, like R-Y-F Records. It was a misspellation of my name that happened on the label of the of the original Ravens. <laughs> mm -hmm. So anyway, riffrecords.com. But if you go to keef.com, theravens.com, companyofwolves.com, like it all goes to the same place, barleyjuice.com. Okay. So you can actually like um you know you can you we've got a page for the ravens and you can buy all their stuff and you can read about them we've got a page for barley juice same thing so that's the thing whoever you like the best you want to you like the ravens the ravens.com uh keith.com you know riffrecords.com that t takes you to everything okay and if, whatever you can't find on there just go on instagram or facebook yeah and, right and stalk us Sure, sure. Is Riff Records R Y F? Is it Riff Records and Entirety dot com? One, one word. Okay. Dot com. Okay. I'm, I'm going to put all these links in the show notes so people can find you and your stuff Perfect. and everything, and yeah. everything. Well, I thank you for coming and joining us tonight. Um, Thanks, Michael. You know, it's really been a pleasure, and I appreciate you coming in and sharing your experiences and your history with us. And um, folks, you heard it right here, Keith Brewer. Make sure you go out and see them at Record Theater September 30th. Um, is this advanced ticket sales or anything, or just go to the Record website? Yeah, they're on right tickets. now. If you just, you yeah. just as easy as Google the Ravens, the Record, and you'll know, come up. Mm -hmm. I don't really remember the link, but it's on my page. So. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm sure they know where to find you, you know. So, uh, so <laughs> folks, again, now. that's right. Get out there and, uh, Show the Ravens some love. Show the Ravens some love. You know, they're going to be sounding great. It's going to be a great show. And we will see you all next time, folks. Michael Spedden signing off. This is Foul Players Radio. Hi, this is Bud Becker. Hi, everybody. Dwight Weems from Gaz the Fun Band. Hi, folks. This is Jay David. Hey, this is Brian Damage from Kicks and Rhino Bucket. Hi, this is Kim of Kim's Crypt. Hello, my name is Gunil Carling. Hi, this is Paul Castiglia, and you're listening to Foul Players Radio, the one-stop shop for all your pop culture needs. And thanks again for tuning in tonight for our interview with Keith Brewer. I really enjoyed the stories of his bands, Climb a Donkey, The Ravens, Company of Wolves, and Barley Juice. And don't forget, The Ravens will be performing a show at Wrecker Theater in Towson, Maryland, Saturday, September 30th, with special guests, The 1974. Tickets are available at thewreckermd.com. Keith Brewer's music, The Ravens, Barley Juice, Company of Wolves, and Solo can be found at www.riffrecords.com. That's R-Y-F records.com. And don't forget, every Tuesday from 4 to 5 p.m. Eastern is the back of the rack, the Michael Spedden Show, only on 97underground.com, Baltimore's pure rock worldwide. You can listen at home or on your laptop or download the app and listen everywhere you go. Looking for some great professional comedic entertainment for your venue, office party, fundraiser, or other special event? Look no further. Please consider A Murder Mystery from the Foul Players of Perryville. For bookings and more information, www.foulplayersofperryville.com, foulplayersperryville at yahoo.com for email, or call us at 443-600-0446. We thank you again for tuning in, and we hope you enjoyed tonight's episode with Keith Brewer. So remember, no matter where you listen, whether it be on our main website, www.foulplayersradio.com or at youtube.com slash at foulplayersradio and hit that like and subscribe button and spread the word. Until next time, this is Michael Spedden signing off. <laughs>